is pretty much guaranteed to be visited and seen by someone else. And you are live. Goodbye. Hello, welcome to World Building 101 um, from Quarancon 2021. So we're very excited. This is not only the first workshop of the con, it's the first workshop that Quarancon has done at all. So I, for some reason, I'm the person that's doing it. So I hope you enjoy this and uh, I hope you find it beneficial. So we have a live chat in YouTube. So be feel free to put some comments on there. Ask any questions as we're going through. Uh, I will be looking for some kind of interaction as well for anything that's like, you know, a bit unclear or anything that you struggle with in world building. Also, there's going to be a link to the Zoom chat. So you can actually just come on, follow that link and come, you can come on here and chat away as well if you'd like to. There's no pressure to do that, but feel free to do it as well. So if you want to come in and chat with me, ask questions in the Zoom chat or ask questions in the live chat. So what is world building? Well, the, the long and short of it is, is turning this little book of notes into something like Robert Jordan's The Great Hunt. Maybe not exactly Robert Jordan's The Great Hunt because he wrote it 30 odd years ago. However, it's quite a big book. And as we're talking about world building, I would say that this is, this series, along with Lord of the Rings, from a fantasy point of view, is um, the best example of world building in fantasy. So it'll be something that we'll be talking about quite a bit. And we have our first guest coming in. This is uh, Christopher Mary Holtman, who I know quite well. And we have someone else coming in as well. Nice to see you. Um, he's looking very, very serious there for, at my words. <laughs> um, nice to see you. And Katie is, is coming in as well. Hi, Katie. Um, so first things first with world building. Why do we world build? Okay. I found a really good quote about this a long time ago. Um, before I even started writing, it was something that I was always interested in as a reader. I'm a fantasy reader, so a lot of this will be kind of what we're talking about, fantasy. Um, however, world building will work for uh, longer stories in terms of horror, sci-fi, anything really. It's just basically it's working out the rules of your own world, how your characters think, how your characters react to things, how the races in your world react to other races, history, culture, all this kind of stuff. And the quote I found was this, good world building shows the reader things your characters see every day, histories and things they notice about their environment. Great world, world building reveals the things your character doesn't see, either because they take it for granted are because they've trained themselves to ignore it. So it's making the tapestry of the world richer. And and it makes you, as a reader, and that's why I started reading fantasy and Lord of the Rings was my, my first big fantasy things, other than maybe Arthurian legends and stuff, which would have its own world building as well, was that I would look at a map and I would stare at it, I would think of all these places that you could go. And the great books like Lord of the Rings, like Wheel of Time, there's a history and a culture already built in for these places where you're thinking, well, well, that is something that I would like to see. All right, so there's a few things to kind of get into with world building. So I'll introduce myself. So I'm David Green. Um, I'm uh, primarily a fantasy author, though I have um, have short stories published in, in horror anthologies and, and science fiction and ones as well. But um, mo mainly I, I write... Um, fantasy my standalone books are fantasy i have the nick holleran series which is a urban fantasy noir and then i have the upcoming um empire of ruin series which is uh dark fantasy somewhere in between grim dark and epic so world building for those kind of things is something that's very very important because like i say it started off like this and the book without world building would probably be this size as well and hopefully with the world building it becomes much more bigger and much richer okay so things to keep in mind when we're going to be doing some world, be world building. And again, like if anyone has any comments, or something that they struggle with with world building or something that they enjoy about world building, please uh, comment away and we'll get to those answers and questions whenever we can with that as well. Um, 
So things to keep in mind is you want to the main the main part of world building is you want to establish you want to establish the world that you want to write in. So that's the first thing. So is it a real world story that you're writing, or is it a second second world? Now the difference between that is, and we can use examples within fantasy. So a real world one would be something like Harry Potter. Um, a real world exists already. However, J.K. Rowling has augmented it with the wisdom world, so it's a secret world that exists in it. Um, Narnia would kind of be like that as well. It's like kind of a hybrid between the two. The other one, second world, is one where you just create it from scratch. So that would be A Song of Ice and Fire, Lord of the Rings, Wheel of Time, um, the Rift World Saga, and and, and uh, books like that. So those ones are ones that. So there's pros and cons of doing both. Obviously, if you're doing a second world, um, you have to create everything from scratch. Okay, but that gives you a lot of freedom to do it, and it's quite daunting. World building can be quite daunting. When I first started writing, um, I was like, I'm not going to write fantasy because I love it so much, and I do not know if I'm going to be good enough as a writer to do world, so to, to do fantasy, and in particular, world building. Okay, um, and so but I ended up going that way because I love fantasy and everything every time I was writing something it was getting longer and longer and I was getting more into the, the world building aspects of it um, the other thing with the uh, real world fantasy is that you already have a world that people can be familiar with with rules and laws and you're just kind of augmenting that or adding to it however you will have to research it and you will have to make sure that the history and everything else works as the reader would expect. Now you can do alternate history, like you know, if you think of sci-fi, like say the Man in the High Castle, and um, that's a great example of that. But it still makes logical sense. It's still there's still a logic involved with it because you're not going to have Adolf Hitler meeting um, Jesus, for example, in that because it's just it, the reader would be like, well, that didn't happen. The only way to do that would be invite a time machine, which would be taken into a completely different kind of story. So it needs to make logical and consistent sense in in your story, even if you are going to be doing an alternate history, which is you know is, is a great way of doing it. But consistency, and that is the thing with world building in general, it is all about consistency and keeping things logical and, and keeping things consistent. Um, so hello to a few people that are in the chat already. Hello, Jennifer and Callum, nice to see you. Um, and Suzanne, Jessica and John, thanks for joining us. I um, hope you find something uh, beneficial from this as well. So we're, we're going, again, if you want to join into the Zoom uh, stream, you can as well. Um, and if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and you can ask a question there. Or you can ask one in the chat. So um, that's the first thing about establishing the world that you want. And then the next thing is decide where you want to start with the, with the world building. So overall, the story has to come first, okay? So the story, you have your idea for the story you've decided where it is you want to fit it, what kind of subgenre you want to do it in. Um, but then decide then where is it you want to start with the world building. What what excites you about world building? Okay, Is it the characters? Is it the maps? Is it naming all of the locations that you're going to create? Is it creating magic systems? Is it creating uh, religious systems? Is it creating different the history of it? All these things come into it, right? So it's deciding is what it is that excites you the most and going with it. And I did mention characters then as well. Character is still completely key when it comes to um, world building. And we'll go into that a little bit deeper later on because I've got some examples what I can show you um, in terms of tools that you can use to help with world building. The character, the character is um, all part because you're going to be seeing the world through the character's point of view. Now, there's a different kind of way of doing it. Like if you talk about something like Lord of the Rings or even Wheel of Time, which is 30 years old now, um, there would be chapters where a character would meet another character and they would sit down and they would just tell them the history of 
a specific location or a specific place. And that was just the way that it was done then. Now it's done a little bit differently. If you take Joe Abercrombie, for example, with his first law books and the, and the books that have kind of spun off from that, he does very organic world building where it's through the character's point of view where they will look at a situation or their environment and they will comment on it or they will think about it or they will use something that has happened in the past to um, to talk about their their current experience right now. So, so that's how the world building is done there because famously, like that that series doesn't ha- doesn't their books don't don't have maps, which is unusual for fantasy. So it is very kind of told through the character's point of view. So the character is key, and you know that's where for, for um, when I started to build out the build out the world properly for In Solitude Shadow. Now I said properly. We'll go back to that one as well because there is the question of. Um, are you, a, are you a plotter or are you a pantser? Now, world building will work for both. And if anyone's got a question about that, um, do ask about it, because we can go into a little bit more detail. Uh, hi, mister. Um, welcome to the chat. The, so when I first started to properly build out the world and this one, I'd kind of got the story down. The characters was the first thing that I kind of worked on because then it was like, what do they do? What, how do they think? What do they like? Um, what don't they like? And from that point on, I could start building other things off off this from the character's point of view. So I just found that easier for myself. However, I know some writers and, and writers that I actually that I know personally and um, writers, like, you know, famously published writers that started from a map. They drew a map first. Tolkien famously started with the language first. He started with uh, the Quenya, he wanted to develop an Elvish language, and that was basically where it started from. Um, so, you know, it all depends on what it is that excites you. So, do what excites you and enjoy it, because world building is enjoyable, it is daunting, but just enjoy it as well. So, maps, just mentioned it there as well. So, um, the maps are, are great. They're, they're great for a few different reasons. Now I'll show you a little example of one of them here as well. So not only are they, fun, are they fun, they're useful for defining the space of your story. Now what I mean by that is, is you could be writing a story about um, something that's being set in place in a city. Let's call it town name, which is what one of my towns was called in my book for a very, very long time. Um, so let's so say it's set in town name, and then you want those characters to travel somewhere else, or they have to go somewhere else to Cityville, okay? Now, how long is that journey going to take? Now, the story will dictate that, but if you have a map in front of you, watch it, even if it's just a little sketch out of a map, you can visualize that yourself as when you're writing it, and knowing, okay, well, this is how long this is. There's this area in between, there's another town in between, there's this and this. These could be things that can come up on the journey along the way, okay? So what I love, I love maps. I have this beautiful book here called The Writer's Map by Hugh Lewis Jones. Oh, it's edited by Hugh Lewis Jones, okay? And it is basically all about the creation of maps, charting them um, and talking about them. And, you know, in some instances, uh, talking to writers about like where they started with the map, um, and it's from all ta- all sorts of different um, books, mainly fantasy ones. We've got stuff from The Hobbit, Narnia, Discworld, uh, Hundred Acre Wood from you know Winnie the Pooh, uh, Cloud Atlas, and it's it's I love maps. I love them. It's one of the things that got me into writing, or even reading in the first place was a map and. Uh, you know, I love them. So I take gr- great pleasure in drawing maps from when I'm doing my world building. Um, none of the ones that I draw are good enough to go into a book, um, but it gives me the basis of where my story is framed. The other thing then is it gives me a sense of scale and size. So if I want to have a character that's from a different part of the continent or place where I'm doing, I can look at it and say, okay, well, this is probably like, um, a cold climate, this is a warm climate, this isn't, you know, that kind of thing. And then that informs me of how they can dress, how they will um, interact coming into a different environment. Um, A great example of this is the Wheel of Time with that map. 
because you have cultures um, that live in deserts and they're coming into a place and, and, and water is scarce and it is sacred to them and they come into a place where water is everywhere it comes out of the sky which they never see and they call the place the wetlands they have a different name for it and they just can't believe that people bathe in water and <laughs> they can't believe that people throw water away once they're finished with it um, because it's it's so sacred for them because they don't see it and that comes from the map because you can see it, that they're in a desert, and then it's like, well, okay, let's talk about this logically. And that's where it comes from. Um, the other good thing about a map as well is that if you are reading, if you are writing something that is on the way to being published, and now I, I did this with, with, um, with my publisher um, for my upcoming Empire of Ruin was, um, I didn't have names for everywhere that was, that was on the map when I was writing it. And one of them I did have a name for, which was a little bit too similar to something from the Game of Thrones, which I hadn't even thought of when I was writing it. It was just there, I hadn't even thought about it. So two of my beta readers read it and they didn't even see it either. And then my publisher was like, you're gonna to have to change the name of this place because it's too similar to, not, to Game of Thrones. And obviously when people hear me talk, I sound like I'm from Game of Thrones. So people would have been like, well, we can see where you've got that from. It wasn't. It was just me just saying this would make sense to be called this because it's here and it just, you know, it's just one of those things. So the name went and it was called Town Name, brackets, Town Name for ages. Um, and then what we did was we did a competition with um, people on my newsletter, people on my social media, just to win a copy of the book when it gets published to give me... Um, I gave a little description about the place because from my world building. So the place in an example was a, it was a, a, a dock town, like a trader town that's like on the, a strip of land that's got water on either side of it and it links to a larger body of, of land. And it is um, a place where people thought, think their God was born and that's where he originated from. And they're very, very religious and they have like a huge statue of this God called a race, uh, or Ras, however you want to pronounce it. I would say Ras probably. Um, and I gave him a little bit of like detail of that and said, help me name it. And we got some great examples coming through. Um, like, you know, we got some great name places. We got some weird and wonderful ones. And, um, we got one that was perfect for it. It was called the end up being Adras, which is uh, worship. Wor it's uh, Ad is the Irish for kind of worship, so it's worship of Ras. Basically, was what the name was ended up being called, um, which was the perfect name for the place. Now I was able to do that, and it was a bit of fun as well. It got people interested in the book, got people talking about it, it got people asking me questions about it as well, which I'm always happy to ask answer questions about my book, um, and. You know, but all that kind of stemmed through the world building because I had this. I mean, the the place is only in maybe two scenes in the in the story, but I had this background for it. Like I knew, even though I didn't have the name correct at the time, I had. I knew what kind of people lived there. I knew um, what the purpose of the place was, and I knew its history. Okay, and it wasn't more than like it wasn't like pages and pages and pages of stuff. It was literally a few lines, but in my head, I could describe it to people. And that is the point, because you could also have a character then say, ah, these people from Adras, they are like this, or they are like this, and they act like this, because the character, because that's just the world that they're in, okay? So we'll talk about the characters again. So when you are, and we'll, I'll go in a little bit deeper this, because there's things that you can do to help develop your characters. Um, so the characters are so important when you're doing your world building. It's easy to get lost in the geography and the history and all this other stuff because one of the good things about um, a good fantasy world is that it will have a history that's just as interesting as the main story, okay? Um, and which is why you get so many prequels and sequels to, to fantasy because, you know, fantasy readers love series. They love a series. Like, think of some of the big series that you've read. Game of Thrones isn't even finished yet. Wheel of Time, there was 14 books and a prequel. The Malazan series has got 10 main books plus about five or six, seven different spin-offs at this stage. Um, even if you want to go more 
um, into the past. You've got the um, you know Eddins with his Belgaria series. It's two sets of five. The Sparhawk books are two sets of five. Fantasy readers love a series, and the reason why you can turn something into a series is because you have this history and this setting that is just as interesting. And you are just telling. And we, again, we'll, we'll use Lord of the Rings as, as an example. The Lord of the Rings is the most influential fantasy book ever written. Um, but in Tolkien's world, it's just one small little aspect of this larger um, conflict and this larger history. Like if you read the Silmarillion, even if you don't read the Silmarillion, and just read the appendices in the Lord of the Rings, you see that there's all this other stuff going on. You know, from from the creation of the creation of time in the Silmarillion, we 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 have the scene where it's the gods are all singing to each other and create this world. Yeah, which is very trippy. Um, I'd love to see someone do something similar these days. Um, and we see this conflict of these gods. It's like a parallel to the Bible, but we see it charted. We see the creation of Middle Earth. We see uh, the First Age, and we see it. We we see all this stuff. It's all there. And the Lord of the Rings is just one little tiny part of that. But it's you know so influential. And that's the thing is when you read Lord of the Rings. Um, and it's one of the things that the film did great to capture is that you see that this is this world you, you see that people have been here for, for thousands of years you see all these different cultures it's great world building okay but it all comes through the character so you think of Lord of the Rings okay and I know most people that are in the chat or most people that are reading this probably would have read it or at least seen the films okay and you see how the characters interact with each other so you have Legolas and Gimli elves and dwarves don't like each other in the world, that's all you need to know in the story, and it gets explored a little bit, and they overcome the differences, uh, which is satisfying for the reader. But in the world, there's a reason why there's a reason why they don't like each other, and that gets explored. You can find that out. It's all in the it's all in the tapestry of the story, but it comes from the character. You have the way that the the hobbits. Everyone knows that the hobbits love mushrooms, and they love half pints of beer and they love smoking and they love the quiet life and, and, the, and their world um, reflects them where they live in the Shire it reflects their character it's idyllic, it's safe it's uh, peaceful, it's somewhere that you would like to live and visit Okay, and as the story gets darker and the characters go through more challenges the world that they travel through becomes reflects that as well so it all comes from what the characters are thinking and they're doing. Um, a great thing then as well, again, is developing the culture. Now, if you're, this is all, we're talking about kind of second world fantasy here, but even if you go with real world fantasy, right? And you want to set it in the future a little bit, you can take where a culture is and just think, okay, well, where, that, where might that be in X amount of years? Or where might that be if something happens whatever your event is in the story which has changed the past what might happen now then another good example wheel of time spoilers for the wheel of time unfortunately but only light spoilers okay so the wheel of time is set in our in, in our future it's on a wheel of time okay so it it's like a pre-industrial revolution world um but it's actually set in our future okay so something happened and all these kind of places got displaced people's got displaced sorry and I mentioned the Ail before there's the, the, uh, a culture of people that live in the desert now they're basically Irish people okay they look like me probably with more hair they're ginger for the most part red headed uh, very very pale um, and they live in the hottest part of the world that is created right now that is what he was Basically, he, he merged some of the aspects with them as well. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a bit of samurai about them. There's a bit of other things about them too. Um, but that was the basis of them, how they look. It was like, I'm going to take this people that look like this, I'm going to put them in this place, which is just, you know, I live in Ireland, obviously, and it's wet. It rains all the time. It's green. Um, you know, that's the way it is so we took that place and was like okay i'm going to put them here how would that change that culture how would that change that person those people how would they react to it okay um and belief systems what is a character's belief system 
Okay, that's a really important thing as well, especially if you're going to be doing a fantasy that has magic. What is their belief system? Do they believe in magic? Do they think magic is good? Do they think magic is bad? Is there a god in the old world? Are many gods? And when you're doing this with the characters, the thing that wants to underpin this, and also with the histories, is conflict. Make sure there's conflict, because if you're going to put a party of people together, you don't want them all to just get along straight away. A great example, again, is Joe Abercrombie's First Law series, um, particularly the first book. You have this cast of people and it's like it's kind of playing with the tropes because you think they're going to get on together and be heroes and go and do this great thing. They all hate each other, right? And that's why it's grimdark, so it's that's fine. But it's also funny because they just despise each other. And that's because they're all from different parts of this world and they all have different types of beliefs. And their beliefs just rub everyone, each other up the wrong way. Everything they do. Even Logan Ninefingers, who is a nice character when he isn't the bloody nine, when he has his like, you know, berserker thing on. He's trying to be nice to people, but because he's a barbarian from the north, the other people just think he's, you know, they just they just don't like him. And it's because of his background and his culture. And then there's, you know, that, and that's and that's great world building. Again, it's because these people they know what they like. They have their own experiences. They have their own beliefs. And you know, it works so very well, okay? Um, just checking some of the uh, the comments there. Um, yeah, town name, other town, Port City, are my favorite placeholders, that's from Virginia. Yeah, Port City is a good one, actually. Not used that one, I must. Um, yeah, you'll know how long that takes unless you're RJ Backer who refuses to figure it out. <laughs> yes, that is that is correct. That is, that's one of the things that kind of does kind of annoy me. That's just about travel. Um, you know, a lot of fantasy writing is, is it seems a lot of the time is, um, and we, uh, Christopher who's in the Zoom call, uh, we do a, a Wheel of Time podcast and obviously people that have read Wheel of Time know that like something happens where they can overcome, the, the first few books is all very travel heavy, it's people going from here to here to here and it's weeks on the road and loads of great things happen on the road and everything as well but a lot of fantasy writing is how can we create something where people can travel very, very quickly from A to B and not have all this kind of stuff in it? And if you read any kind of fantasy series, apart from Lord of the Rings, although even with the Eagles, with Lord of the Rings too, there is something that will happen that either gets created or like something that gets rediscovered, which will take characters are able to go from one place to the next place very, very quickly. Doesn't quite happen with R.J. Backer's, uh, Backer's books. Uh, John Winkleman, hi, good guy, Central, bad guy, Central, yeah. Um, so we have a, a little question here from uh, Callum, saying, Panzer or Plotter? Um, he says, my work feels very fluid, and and if it trips me, and it trips me song, horror works well with Panzers, but fancy works well with Plotters. Is that true from your experience? Right, so I think with world building, there's, there's two ways of, of it, right? Okay, so you can... So plotters will world build from the start and they will just get straight into it because that's what they're used to. And these and plotters will plot everything. They'll plot short stories. They'll probably even plot drabbles, maybe. I don't know. I'm not a plotter. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm a, I'm a planter, I suppose. Now, I used to be a panther, but then working with my, uh, my um, a publisher um, has made me very much more of a... has brought a lot more planning into it. Um, so when I, when I wrote Empire of Ruin, the first book in Solitude Shadow, I was very much a panther. I had the idea for it, the idea for the story, and, the, and a few of the like concepts that I had in just very, very rough note form. And I wrote the first draft to get it to the point where it was readable, and it was like someone, could, someone like a publisher could read it and go, yeah, we would like to take do this, but it needs more development, which it was like it was a novella at the time. It was about 30,000 words. Uh, I got it back and then I world built. I went into it in a lot more detail after writing the actual main story. So it was kind of like the plot, the pants away of doing it. I had the story down and then I went back into it and said, okay, where can I build these things out from ideas that I'd had when I'd been writing? I'd be like, that's cool. I could do more of that. I could do more with this and this. So absolutely, as a as a panther, you can do that. 
but it's probably for a panzer it will be after you've revised the story at, this, at, at the point okay and obviously that can get a little bit messy because you want to make sure the consistency is correct you don't want to like once you've done your story and you've come up with like some world building you don't want it to contradict something that's already in the story so it's a lot of revision and a lot of and trust me i know because that's what i did with in solitude shadow um and then when i went back then for the next round of edits i'd had the world completely built out using stuff that i'm going to show you in a little while and it was so much easier because i had all these rules and i had all these things that i knew exactly how these characters were going to react i knew how people from a certain place were going to react and all this kind of stuff the other side of it is a, as, a, as a plotter. Now, people will do this, plotters will do this as a, as a thing. Now, the thing that I would say for, as a, for a plotter from talking to a lot of them and kind of interviewing them is that there may be the um, temptation to just keep world building and not to actually start writing. That is also a, a thing, that's the other side of the coin. Um, and also if you're writing something and you have a good idea but it may be something that you've not already got in your plans don't be afraid of that like explore it as well and see if you can work it in but that would be the main thing is just to if you're getting too bogged down in the world building just start writing write the prologue write the first chapter write a few scenes with the things that you've built and see how they work um, so yeah Chris Banner's first novel was steampunk fantasy and it was completely pantsed and she had to do major rewrites because of it. Um, you know, uh, I don't, you know, that, that's the way, the, I think revision's quite fun. Um, my favorite process of writing in Solitude Shadow has been the revision part of it. I've loved it. And especially after I've built the world out. So I wrote the story, 30,000 words or so, um, built the world out, did the revisions. It's now at 60,000 words. It's doubled in size. It's still got the same pace to it, but there's just so much more stuff going in it because I built that world out and I just explored more things in it. And it wasn't stuff that I was going to leave for a sequel either. It was just more stuff that was to do with those characters and that story because it's very character driven. Um, yeah, uh, Katie Z, Robin Hood. Yeah, Rob, a big Robin Hood fan. She's great in world building. Um, yeah. P.S. Uh, Pam has tomes of material that will never see the light of day. When you've sold all your books and people want them, they, you know, what I've noticed is that they just released them in encyclopedias. It's great. I have loads of them. <laughs> I literally have about uh, about 10 different encyclopedias based on like Wheel of Time or Lord of the Rings or other things like that. I'm a huge nerd. Um, so Callum again asks, is it characters first and situations? Um, I'll come back to that one. I'll come back to that one a little, a little bit, okay? Yes, plants in for the win. I agree, plants in is the way. Um, so the other thing, another thing just to, to make sure that you bear in mind is the rules of your world. They must be consistent. And in, this, in, in terms of the rules, what I mean here in particular is, um, is language and magic, okay? So language is like, how do people talk? And I don't mean like create your own languages or anything, but it's like, if someone swears a lot, may, you know, make sure that that's part of their dialogue. Don't make sure everyone, and that's something that I learned the hard way, because I like my characters to swear, but there can be, what I have discovered, there can be too much swearing. Isn't that crazy? But it's true, because when I was, when it was pointed out to me by my publisher, and I read one paragraph in particular i was kind of just wincing i was like man there is just too much swearing in this so it was again build that into your world building what is your character's background are they the type of person that will swear because not everyone does i've just been talking for 35 minutes and i've not swore once which is a record for me i will be swearing like a trooper as soon as this is finished i can assure you however if i was a character in a book i would swear i would use slang that's how i talk However, if it was someone that was like a high lord or a noble, would they swear as much? Maybe not, okay? And then also as well with the swearing, um, you know, do they use our swear words or do they have their own swear words? That's another thing as well, part of the world building. And that's something that you can do with your fan base for your social medias is um, help ask them to help create uh, swear words for you or something like that. ask them what they think about swearing and uh, swearing in fantasy some people like it some people don't ultimately do what you think is best 
but make sure that it's consistent, okay? Um, and that's the same with magic. Magic is key to fantasy if you're going to have a magic system, okay? It has to be consistent. Now, you can have a hard magic system, which is something that's almost like scientific, where there is like, you know, different, all kinds of different rules. Or you can have a soft magic system. Now, two examples of that would be, uh, I won't use Lord of the Rings for once, but that is definitely a soft magic system. Um, David Eddins, Bell Garriad, they have a magic system where they have um, sorcerers, I suppose they could call them, that use something called the will and the word. And that is basically their willpower can enact something to happen. That is basically it, okay? Um, and if their willpower is stronger than someone else's, then they will win. And that's it. The only And there's only one real hard rule in that, is that they can't bring people back from the dead. But that is a hard rule that's put into it, and it doesn't get contradicted, okay? Um, a hard magic system would be something um, like um, Brandon Sanderson in his Mistborn series, or um, Way of the King and, and, and those kind of books. Wheel of Time as well. We won't mention Wheel of Time. Um, they're hard magic systems. They have very defined rules. They have certain people that can use it. They have power rankings between the characters. Um, they have reasons why things can't work, reasons why things can work. So there is um, a lot of that that kind of, you have to kind of think about that and think, right, how is it going to work in my world? What kind of magic system um, do I want to have? Now, there's a great quote from Brandon Sanderson, and this is like an abbreviated quote. His first rule is called the Sanderson Rules of Magic, right? Because he does great, uh, he does fantastic videos on his YouTube on creative writing and if anyone wants to check them out do so because they're brilliant they're kind of long like each one is over an hour long but um they're great and i think he's a great writer as well he's a, he's a great imagination um so brandon sanderson's youtube is great so his first rule in sanderson's rule of magic is this to solve magic exists to solve problems in a satisfying way that the reader can understand okay so Basically, you have to introduce this magic system, make sure it makes logical sense in your world, um, and make sure that the reader understands that and then how it's used is satisfying. So what he means by being satisfying is don't cheat. Don't put them in a situation where you're just using magic all the time to solve the situations, which is stuff that you've never mentioned before as well. Because he goes into more detail talking about this, about how he wrote himself into a hole um, in his final scene because he just had a character using a power that hadn't even been mentioned or hinted at to solve a situation and he realised it was unsatisfying. Um, and that's the other thing with magic. There has to be situations where the magic will not work and it has to be solved in a different way because it, otherwise it robs tension from the story because you have an all-powerful character. Um, you just, you're going to end up putting yourself into a trap where you have to keep this character away. And there are a couple of things that... Sorry, there's my wedding ring hitting my uh, table. Um, there's a couple of um, good examples of this. So you have Raymond E. Feist's... Uh, Rift War Saga. So the, the the initial trilogy I love. I think it's brilliant, especially the first one. Magician is is a fantastic book. But he kept on doing spin-offs, and it got to the point where one of the main characters, Pug, who is the magician, the magician of the story, um, has become so powerful that if he was to basically be in any situation, there was in these books, he could just solve it without even. Uh, breaking a sweat so the plots then became to the point where it was like how can we keep Pug away from the rest of the characters and how can we keep um, you know him not interfering and solving everything which is but in the end he would appear and solve everything and I'm a big Star Wars fan and I was a big fan of the extended universe and I know lots of people like the extended universe I did too for the most part but that kind of fell into the same trap as well because Luke because obviously there are all books that were particular ones that were set after Return of the Jedi Luke had become so powerful that 
they even created a race of aliens, which was very un-Star Wars-like, called the Yuuzhan Vong, that the Force would not affect them, which goes against what Star Wars pretty much is from George Lucas's own mouth. He says, the Force is something that penetrates and binds everyone together. It surrounds everyone, okay? So to create, so their, their solution to this problem of Luke being too powerful was like, we will create a new, a new race that the Force can't affect. But that's not really Star Wars, and it's kind of cheating. Okay, so that's the thing as well. You don't want to get someone too powerful, power creep, where it's where they can just solve everything. There needs to be realistic and logical um, boundaries. Okay, when you're creating a magic system. So the last thing we'll talk about before I show you some kind of little tips and everything is the history of the world. I'm a huge history buff. I did history in college. I love history. And I love history and fantasy as well. It's one of my favorite things. I will spend ages and ages and ages on Wikipedia pages researching everything to do with everything. If I watch a film, I'll go on the IMDb afterwards and read all the trivia. I love all that kind of stuff. And that's why I love hit, uh, fantasy books so much is because of the history of these worlds, okay? Um, Steal from the past if you want to, right? And do your own spin on it. The Malazan books by Steven Erickson. Um, the Malazan Empire is basically, a, a, you know, it's the Roman Empire. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of um, degrees. How the thing works. There was an emperor, and there's a, you know, all this kind of stuff. But even like the fact that there's, there's legions, and then they were they were aggressively. Um, taking over parts of the world that like, you know, and all this kind of stuff. The Malazan Empire works exactly the same way in Stephen Erickson's books. Obviously then, it branches off into weird and wonderful places involving magic and other realms of reality and all sorts of stuff. If you've not read the Malazan books, do. They're a big, big read. It's a big ask to do it. It's a big undertaking, but it's pretty rewarding, I think, and it's great world building too. Um, but yeah, he steals from the past. Um, you know, uh, Mark Lawrence's, um, what's the name of his series? Broken Empire series. They're set in our future. Again, there's something that happens, you know, Terry Brooks' Shannara books are set in our future as well. And it does go back to, you know, so that's the part of the history. The part of the history is our world. Something has happened and it, and you know, Another another part of history has been created on top of that, but ultimately, so if you're thinking of Lord of the Rings and you're thinking of the first age with the elves and all this kind of stuff, um, in Mark Lawrence's Broken Empire, that same time frame, that's our that's our world, that's our history. So it's a, it's, it's a nice little shorthand, but it's interesting as well because I don't know about you, but when I'm reading all these things, and then I realise that it's set in our world um i love it it really really excites me so if anyone has any um questions um or any kind of things that you want to talk about in particular please either come on to the zoom call or just let leave me a little note um and we can start working through them in the we have about 25 minutes left of this um so yeah please just jump in if you want if anyone wants to ask anything in particular that we've not kind of gone through and i'll kind of give you a few examples in the meantime of what you can do tip, tips hints and tips um there's the zoom link uh virginia's just put the, the zoom link there as well so uh yeah big discussion on fantasy swearing there yeah, tom says there it's desensitizing to a little bit too much doesn't have the impact yet um anthem says loves fantasy swearing Love all the ways authors can come up with their own language. Yeah, that's true. Um, Callum asked, do you have carry rules over all your stories? Um, yeah, uh, I, I would. Yeah, especially the fantasy ones, because I just think it's... Um, it's not to say that something new can't happen. Like, you, you can't get to, like, the, uh, you know, the second or third book and a, and a new different kind of talent is found or a new way of doing something is found. But that also has to make sense in the world. It can't just be... If, so you use the um, Belgaria as an example. They say their only rule is that you can't bring people back from the dead. It's to be in the third or fourth book and then someone does that just by clicking the fingers would be just... It's 
cheating. It's just it's and it's just robbed everything that's gone before because it's like, well, why did no one do it before? Okay, um, but you can definitely develop the rules that are already in your world. I think that's something that can be done. Um, yeah, Nick Brett says about power creep and George R. R. Martin is probably the poster child for pilfering from history. Yeah, well, Game of Thrones, uh, Song of Ice and Fire, when you take out the magical stuff, it's basically the War of the Roses. That's what it was based on. It was, you know, in history, it was, it was that conflict. Um, yeah, so there's lots of that kind of stuff. Cold War and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's loads of inspiration that you can borrow from for that kind of stuff. So... With that in mind, and say if you've got any questions, just pop them into the chat or come onto the Zoom call. The, the, the link is there. Um, not every world needs to be, especially in fantasy, needs to be a European medieval world. Okay, that is the go-to for a lot of for a lot of world building. It's because we're familiar with it. I think it's because we see it so much. We learn about it, especially in my part of the world. We learn about it in school quite a lot, and um, and. Um, you know, it's something that is we just see it all the time, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, you know, the setting can definitely inform the subgenre of of um, the fantasy that you're writing. So, if it's say a Victorian setting, for example, um, that would speak really well to like kind of gaslight fantasy or even steampunk or something like that. But just just explore different parts of the world like there's no rules saying that you can't uh, there's some great ones uh, that you can just mash them together you can just take you know why not Iberian why not South American why not Japanese why not just do a big mash of all these kind of things it's a fantasy world it is not real um, it is your creation so not everything has to be European medieval and I'm not saying that's bad I love me some European medieval <laughs> fantasy and just in general. I love the era, era. It's great. There's so much stuff. That's why we like to write about it. That's why we like to see it. But there's more. And don't let the devil's trappings stifle your imagination as a writer. Do what you want to do. But if you are going to be kind of basing it on something, research it. Make sure it's researched. Because you might take a setting and say, okay, well, this is going to be uh, heavily set in India. Like, India is, like, kind of the inspiration, for example, okay? Then make sure that if someone from India is reading it, that they can see it and it doesn't um, do something completely wrong. Obviously, it's your setting, it's just inspired, but you don't want to do something where it's, like, drawing people out of the story, okay? Um... Anthem asks, do you prefer, prefer worlds with magic where everyone has like, access to the magic, kind of like Harry Potter? Are people where you have to be born with the magic, like Wheel of Time? Oh, that's a good question. I don't really have a preference. Um, it's, the, it's how it's executed, I think, is, is, is the great way. And the good thing about the two that you use as an example there is they both have specific rules about this as well. Because obviously with Harry Potter, like it's only... You know, it's, wizards are also like are human as well. Like it's like they're kind of born with it too. And there's people that are in the wizarding world, like squibs that can't use magic. But there's, there's defined rules there. And the great thing, I think the, the funny thing about Harry Potter is that they all go to school to learn all this magic and then they all just get jobs in like middle management, which I think is like the most hilariously depressing thing in the world. Um, and yeah, the other kind of thing with like Wheel of Time, like from your example, if people are born with it, it's um, there's very defined and strict rules to that as well. Like it's not a lot of people. He actually, I think it's two percent of the population. I think it is. I think in, 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 it's in the books. I think it's, it's definitely in, the, in his notes and in the encyclopedia that he, he brought out. He has the entire workings of that. The entire workings of his magic system is in the encyclopedias, and he actually has all of the characters that are ever mentioned that can use the one power um, ranked against each other as well. It's quite mind-boggling. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have a preference as long as it's um, as long as it's executed well. Like, I mean, Lord of the Rings is a great example where there is basically no magic. Like even Gandalf and Saruman, like. What is it they can do, like, you know, in terms of what magic do they actually have? What can they do? Um, it's never really explored all that deeply. 
Um, but they're basically the only people that can do it. There's no one else that can do it. There's magical kind of creatures, there's magical objects, but there's no specific wizards kind of people, okay? Um, character and world cards, all right? So I'm gonna show you a couple of things on my screen that I'll just go through, and then, and then I'll do the last, there's some questions coming in. So I'm just gonna show you the last couple of little things and um, that are really good, useful tools. So there's one that's like kind of more of an entry level thing. And I will give a shout out to my wonderful publisher, Michelle River, for um, giving these to me is, word is character cards. So you can use these for all sorts of stuff, okay? Now this is, um, and you get, a, this is kind of a little bit of a spoiler, I suppose, if you're gonna pick up my book when it's out, but I, it's fine, it's, there's no big story um, things here, okay? So this is basically a character card. So you can do this for the world, you can do it for a city or a town, you can do it for um, a, a culture, you can do it for anything that you find that you need to do. You can get these kind of things online. I have a load of these mocked up if anyone's watching and they want to get one off me reach out to me you know you can find me online you can find me anywhere and i will email them to you they're really really helpful so this is like a little one about um one of my protagonists there's, there's a few protagonists okay so i have these for the protagonists the antagonists some of the main supporting characters and it's all this kind of stuff name Kate Bessem. any kind of nicknames is age uh, his race, is he magical, uh, gender, skin colour, um, you know, where, what's the inspiration between, behind that, so he's like, he's like Southern European, because like my one is kind of based in like a kind of Iberian kind of setting, because um, I love, I love the Mediterranean, it's great. Um, physical traits, he's six foot one, slim, virgin on gaunt due to substance addiction, he was a capable swordsman, Though lack of practice and substance abuse has dulled his reactions and strength. His handsome though worry lines have eaten into his forehead and his eyes are ringed with heavy shadows. Okay? Um, so it's nothing like that's that's just background information for, for me, basically, that I'm gonna so I can keep it when I'm describing him or what I'm using him, I can kind of use that to inform what I'm doing. Uh, mannerisms is controlled due to his history and politics and a strict upbringing. He holds his head high, a fighter's posture. His hands tremble when he hasn't had a hit of Octarian spice. His personality is guilt ridden at his past actions. And this gives him some backstory as well, which is the key kind of thing and his likes and his dislikes. You can see down here that he has likes, dislikes. What's his clothing style like? What is he dressing? Um, family relations. Um, you know, what is his mother and father alive? Does he have any siblings? Where does he rank in those siblings? Is the oldest? Is the youngest? They will tell you a bit about the character as well. Social relations. Is he married? What's his past history? Does he have children? And then background information. This is his backstory. Um, so some of this backstory is obviously is used in the in the book. Um, but what it's used mostly for is is to is to tell me how he is going to react when he is in certain situations. My world is one that has massive xenophobia um, because of this place that they live called Hauptveld is very warlike and they are trying to get all the people that live there to hate anything that isn't Hauptveldian because they are based on war, they make money from war, they, um, that is their goal, it's because it keeps people, the emperor at one point says how it, war keeps people pliable and when they're at peace, people are reminded of their rights. So they want to keep people fighting and downtrodden. And through this, it's this huge xenophobia. So Cade is actually, um, has a half elven son, um, which is like a big scandal and he kind of keeps it hidden. So if he comes across someone who is, you know, he has to pretend to hate elves as well, like everyone else does. But if he come, but internally he doesn't. And if he's coming across someone who is like very, very like anti, anti this and anti that, I'm really kind of taking it to the to the edge. How is he going to react in that kind of situation? And that's how I know from this. Okay, so this is one of the things that is good. And I say, if anyone wants anything, I've got I've got um, templates for all these kind of things that I can send out to you as well. Okay, the other thing that I find is really good is World Anvil. Now this takes it a little bit more 
uh, serious, I suppose. World Anvil is basically like Wikipedia, your own Wikipedia. Um, you, can get a, you can get an account on worldanvil.com um, and you get your own dashboard and you have your world and you have, you can make a map on here. You can have all these kind of timelines, secrets. You can load up any kind of images and files. You can put your manuscripts in here as well. And also what you can do is have all this kind of stuff, generic articles, uh, buildings and landmarks, characters, um, so much stuff, myths and legends. And this is just basically your own um, Wikipedia for your own book. And it's all there just for you. And, it, and it, you can go as, as deep or as surface level as you want to, but it's all there if you don't want to have notes anywhere. And the good thing about it is when you're kind of building it is, um, like I have one for my other series, my Nick Holleran series, is there you can see it all kind of building up. And if there's something that you kind of just forget ever so slightly, you can just do a little search for it and it's there, the answer is there. So that's worldandable.com. But on that note, I find it best is just to kind of keep it simple at the start, okay? So go into as much depth as you like and go into and all that kind of stuff and, and write about as much stuff as you want, but try and keep it secret, secret, simple. Don't trip yourself up, which is, you know, don't, by that, I mean that is don't write yourself into a hole. Don't put yourself in circles where you're just trying to figure out the very, very inner workings of, of the political sphere of a world that you've created. Let your writing dictate that. You just give the boundaries and then let the, and then let the writing take over. Um, the main point of all of the world building, and this is the thing that I will stress the most, and I mentioned it before, but the main point is creating conflict. Because without it, there are no stakes and there's no drama and there's no tension and then there's no story. So all the world building, whether it's with places and geography and characters, is to create conflict between people who are going to meet each other and people that are going to be in the story because that is where the story comes from and that is where world building can really really sink so we'll go into a few of the questions because that's pretty much everything that i've got there so and again any last few questions get them in because we're going to probably be wrapping up in the next 10 minutes but i'll go through some of the questions there now uh, Virginia, yes, thank you. There could be non-European that's on that earth parallel. Yes, there can be. Um, uh, John Wilkerman says, Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James, set in Italian, medieval Africa, with practically zero influences. Yeah, it's a really good book as well. Uh, Nick Brett asks, um, where do you stand on the idea of directly nerfing a character who has become too powerful, breaking them in some way to produce a limitation? Is that likely to be sound stifling? Um, I'm a big gamer and uh, I'm a big fan of Metroid and this is what the start of every single Metroid game used to do and it used to annoy me a little bit was that you'd finish one of the games and you'd be super super powerful and then you'd start the next one and something would happen and you'd lose all of your powers. Um, it can be something that you don't, it's, it can be a useful tool for a character. I mean, it's a challenge and that's the thing that you want to do. You want to challenge your characters. So if your character is all powerful um, and you know a big challenge for them would be to take away those powers how do they overcome them but it's not something that you want to do all of the time and that's something that like when we talked about um, Pug the character Pug that is something that Raymond D. Feist started to have to do with every single spin off that they did um, they had to start doing it in the, in the with, with Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars books, and it's it becomes it becomes too much. Like it's become again, it robs tension. Because it's like, well, what's going to happen to take these powers away? So I think you know, doing it once in a in a in a, in a series to a character is is fine. Like and, and I, you know, it's something that you'd expect because say you want to challenge your character. So if your character gets to this place and it's as high as they can go you want and it's still and there's still story left you want something that's going to bring them down again okay to let them build themselves back up or if it's grimdark bring them all the way down and leave them there because that is also a viable option um yeah some more examples in the chat of of fantasy that's set that is not um european so um song of shattered sands is set in middle east fantasy uh, Layers of, of uh, Anuska, which is set in like Gaslight Slavic, that sounds really interesting actually. 
Um, yeah, that's my Twitter. There's our fans, Virginia. Uh, campfire. Uh, Pam asks about campfire. I've never used it. Um, I, I just use Word Anvil, but like I'm open to using different things. I mean, Word Anvil is just an, an example. I'm sure there's like there's, there's loads and loads if you just do a quick search for it. And also, just pen and paper. Just go to town with it. That's all it is. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, Jess um, Halsey, who's doing a reading tomorrow, um, or tonight, sorry, uh, in, I think, five hours' time, I think, off the top of my head. Um, so tune in for that. She uses, she's tried a world anvil as well, and she finds it hard to use. Yeah, I mean, it can be, like, you know, uh, I, I messed around with it for a while. I, I, I just made something up that I wasn't even working on first to kind of use it. Um, so... Yeah, there's, there's other options out there. Go go and have a look around and see what works for you. It might not work for you. Um, you know, the, the benefit of them is that it kind of keeps everything in one place um, and you can kind of search for them. But it might be something that doesn't work for you. You might want to use character cards or place cards or just pen and paper. You know, whatever works, it's part of the exploration of building it is whatever works. So that is everything for me. I hope that you've enjoyed um world building 101 um keep checking out quarancon uh thanks very much uh, to virginia and pam for inviting me to do this for doing the first ever workshop i hope it wasn't a disaster um, you, David. it was great oh, there we go. There we <laughs> go. Coming on as a disembodied voice um <laughs> but no thank you so much this was wonderful i hope people got lots out of it um do find dave on twitter and um and and shoot him more questions if you've got them um, also, everyone, please don't forget to check out Artist Alley, where you can find actually David's books as well as some others. Check under Erie River Publishing. Erie or Irie? Erie. Erie. Yeah, Erie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Irie Irie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Erie River Publishing, and uh, and and check that out. I believe. Um, you can find uh, Dave's books through that. Of course, there's also just Amazon, but make sure you go read all his books if you haven't already. Um, some of you appear to be super fans, which is great. Um, but if you are, if you haven't tried them out yet, um, they sound very intriguing. Uh, also, uh, yeah, there are a bunch of other artists at Artist Alley. Um, we've got uh, different authors and different, uh, oh, why is it showing me? Oh, it's because it's on speaker view, that's why. <laughs> Fix that. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, yeah, do be sure to uh, to check out our Artist Alley. And uh, our next event is the editing panel, which starts at 10.30 Central Time. That's 30 minutes past the hour, whatever time zone you're in. And um, and we will would love to see you there. Uh, any any last comments, Dave? No, that's it. Thanks very much for, for having me on. I uh, really enjoyed doing this. Um, I was actually thinking, can I do it for a full hour? But I definitely could and probably <laughs> longer. <laughs> Yes, you definitely, you filled it quite nicely. There was no, no downtime. Well done. Um, all right. Thanks so much, everyone. And um, yeah, please, this will this will stay up so you can come back and use it for reference forever. So um, go ahead and, and do that. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I'm going to be ending the stream now. Bye-bye. And the stream is officially.